This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. Welcome to episode 5 of Cold Case Detectives Too Close to Home, a monthly Patreon-sponsored series where we select five Patreon supporters at random and examine cases featuring their hometowns. If you'd like to see your own hometown featured, you can check out our Patreon linked below. And now let's dive into the cases that haunt your hometown. The mysteries that strike too close to home. Mary Cooper. Our first case for this month's Too Close to Home comes from our patron, Claire Douglas, who chose the town of Thursk in England, a small market town located in North Yorkshire. Thursk has a tiny population of around 5,000 and is most well known for the case of the Sutton Bank Body, a Jane Doe investigation which we have already covered in an episode of Cold Case Detective. Expanding our search outwards to the rest of the county, we found a little-known and tragic historical case from Middlesbrough in the 1800s. Mary Cooper was just eight years old in 1884. A happy child, she lived with her parents and two sisters at 66 Waterloo Road. On June 21st, she went to play hide-and-seek with her sisters at Albert Park, just a five-minute walk from her house. A blue-eyed and fair-haired child, Mary was wearing one of her favorite outfits that summer day, a red bonnet and a long blue flowered dress. While her two sisters returned home at lunchtime, Mary did not, although her parents were not concerned, thinking she was playing with friends. However, when she did not return for dinner, they became alarmed and began searching, accompanied by friends, other family members, and worried locals. Still there was no sign of Mary. The following day, the police were notified of the little girl's disappearance. While Albert Park workers dredged the lakes, the police organized on-foot searches, combing the area for any evidence of the eight-year-old. But once again, they came up empty-handed. It was two days later, on June 24th, that two local boys came across a horrific scene in the park the body of Mary Cooper. Her throat had been slit, and the blood was on her clothing, her red bonnet pulled over her face. The two boys had been playing cricket when their ball landed in the shrubbery at a small hillock named Bell Mount, 50 yards from the upper lake. The area had previously been searched, and the terrified boys quickly raised the alarm. While police investigated, they discovered that Mary had been assaulted. Her face was bloodied. PC Douglas Edward was the first officer on the scene and was understandably traumatized by what he saw. He carried Mary home to her parents. At the same time, Mary's mother was returning home on a tram from Newport after another fruitless search. It was here that she overheard a conversation in which the discovery of her daughter's body was discussed. In the following days, a rusty, white-handled penknife was found in the park. Traces of blood on it and the style of the blade confirmed it was the murder weapon. In the weeks following, the police made a few arrests, but none of their leads panned out. First, two homeless men were arrested for the crime. They came under suspicion when they were spotted ripping up their clothing for no reason. However, it was discovered that the two men were about 80 miles away at the time of the crime and so they were released. The second suspect in the case was a man which newspapers at the time described as a, quote, half-witted misfit. He was arrested in July, but was eventually released when a witness corroborated his alibi. At a dead end, desperate investigators who felt pressured to close the case appealed to Scotland Yard for assistance. Detectives from London brought a famous sniffer dog with them 
in the hopes he would find more clues. The bloodhound, named Morgan, had previously helped lead the police to a barber who was wanted in connection with a murder in Lancashire. Sadly, Morgan was unable to provide law enforcement with any new information. Two years passed, and still, Mary's attacker remained at large. In 1886, another mentally ill man was arrested and subsequently released. The Middlesbrough Town Council offered a reward of £100 to anyone with information which would lead to an arrest and conviction. £100 in 1886 is the modern equivalent of around £13,300 today. However, the reward was never claimed, and no one was ever charged or convicted in Mary's slaying. The Bell Mount Killer has never been identified. Following her death, locals began believing that the area was haunted. According to local legend, if you stop near Bell Hill at dusk, you'll hear bells ringing in Mary's memory. Mary was buried on June 26th, 1884. Hundreds of mourners lined the streets to pay their respects to the girl whose life was taken too soon and her grieving family. She's buried in a corner of Linthorpe Cemetery, where her headstone still stands. Natalie Pearman. Our next case location is brought to you by our patron Claire Campbell, who chose the city of Norwich in England. Located in the county of Norfolk, Norwich is filled with beautiful historic buildings, cobbled streets, Tudor homes, and has 33 medieval churches. Most notably for crime buffs, however, is that Norwich is the backdrop for one of the United Kingdom's most horrific murders. Natalie Jane Pearman had a regular and unremarkable first 14 years of life. She lived in the coastal city of Mundersley with her two siblings, her stepfather Chris and her mother Lynn. Described as an artistic girl with a love for horses and ballet, she later decided that as an adult, she would like to travel and perhaps even join the RAF. However, Natalie's life took a sharp turn when her stepfather lost his job and the family began to struggle financially. Around this same time, the 14-year-old began acting out and fell in with the wrong crowd. As her parents struggled to control her while scrambling to keep themselves afloat financially, Natalie continued to lash out and began using drugs. Eventually, she ended up in care. Her time in care appears to be undocumented and is only briefly mentioned in articles and documentaries about her case. To keep a roof over her head, Natalie, at just 16 years old, entered into the world of sex work. She told friends about how she was earning a lot of money and living lavishly, and despite the dangers associated with the job, she appeared happy with the money she was bringing in and the freedom it allowed her. Initially, Natalie used sex work as a means to earn a little extra cash from time to time to fund her drug usage, but quickly it became her sole source of income, and she worked most days using the names Maria and Vicky. Natalie was last seen alive on Thursday, November 19th, 1992. Following her death, authorities were able to put a small timeline together of her final evening. First, she was picked up by a client and taken three miles away from Norwich to the hamlet of Whitlingham. She was safely dropped off in the red light district before being picked up by a second client, whom she accompanied back to his home. Again, Natalie was returned to her area of work. She was last seen at around 1 a.m. outside the Ferry Boat Inn, a pub on King Street. Just hours later, at 3.50 a.m., on the morning of November 20th, a lorry driver saw the lifeless body of a girl lying in a lay-by at Ringland Road, on the outskirts of Norwich, about a 15-minute drive from the red light district where Natalie worked. Police were quick to arrive on the scene and secure the area. The body, naked from the waist down, was identified as 16-year-old Natalie Pierman. Her cause of death was established as suffocation. Forensic swabs revealed that she had semen in her body and her underwear from three separate people, and a DNA profile was created and loaded onto the National DNA Database. 
Authorities hoped it would lead to the teenager's killer. Over the course of the investigation, 700 male DNA samples have been taken and 4,000 people interviewed. Yet, despite this massive effort, Natalie's case remains unsolved. Her two clients on the evening of November 19th were traced, and they helped police to build a timeline of events. However, the third sample, found on the 16-year-old's body, has not been identified. Authorities believe this sample was from a man who'd had sex with Natalie between 1am and 3.45am, and this unidentified individual is the prime suspect in the case. Investigators have several different theories about Natalie's death. The fact that she was left in clear view has led some to suspect she was killed accidentally by a client and dumped in a panic, while others have speculated that she was left there confidently by someone who had killed before. The area in which her body was found was not well known, even for locals, and was mostly frequented by people engaged in dogging. It is unclear if Natalie was killed in the area, or it was simply a dumping ground, although it is generally thought by detectives to be the crime scene. Some have also wondered if she was murdered by her pimp, and if she was left out in the open as some kind of warning to other sex workers. However, without more evidence or a confession, it is unclear which is the correct theory. Curiously, 36 hours before her murder, Natalie visited her parents, whom she had barely seen since entering care. However, the 16-year-old was not there to reconcile. Instead, she wanted her birth certificate so that she could apply for a passport. When her mother told her that a passport would take a few weeks to obtain, Natalie told her that she didn't have that kind of time. It is unknown if the teenager was scared of something and attempting to flee the country, if she'd been given or offered work as a drug mule, or if a client had offered to take her abroad. Scottish criminologist David Wilson, who works as a professor of criminology at Birmingham City University, has his own theory. Wilson once worked as a prison governor and now specializes in serial killers. Over the span of his career, he has worked with numerous different police forces in the UK and even appeared in a documentary about Natalie, which was created by Irish investigative journalist Donald McIntyre. Wilson has stated on several occasions his belief that Natalie was the victim of a serial killer named Steve Wright, a theory which has been examined by authorities. Wright, who has been dubbed as the Suffolk Strangler and the Ipswich Ripper by the media, is currently serving life imprisonment for the murder of five female sex workers in Ipswich over the course of 10 days in 2006. As most serial killers are known to start committing their crimes before their mid-30s, and Wright was 48 at the time of his murder spree, he is still under investigation. Many experts believe that the 2006 slayings were not his first, and eerily, in the 1980s, he was the landlord of the Ferry Boat Inn, where Natalie was last seen alive. Although his DNA was cross-examined with the DNA on Natalie's body, the results were inconclusive. David Wilson has noted that DNA testing as we know it today was in its infancy back in the 90s, and it would likely be worthwhile to cross-examine the samples again. The Norfolk Constabulary appealed for information on the 25th anniversary of Natalie's death, and received around 45 calls within the first week. In 2018, five men who were thought to possibly be involved with the crime were identified and ruled out. The case has been at a standstill ever since. If you have any information about Natalie's murder, you can contact the Norfolk Constabulary on 01953 424 520. Alternatively, you can call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Yim Young Choi. Moving on to our third case, this one is from our patron Tom Stroming, who chose the hamlet of Franklin Square in Nassau County, New York. While we were unable to locate a case in this specific area, we did find a little-known case just 15 minutes away in the village of New Hyde Park, Nassau County. 
Born on March 27th of 1978 in southern China, Yim Yong Choi emigrated with his family to the US in 1988. The family settled in New Hyde Park as they already had relatives in the area, and Yim, who was known as Jimmy to his friends, quickly picked up the English language. On August 26th of 1998, 20 year old Yim was last seen at around 8.30 a.m. by his sister, who walked by his bedroom and saw him asleep as his door was open. The siblings' parents were away in Australia visiting family at the time, which has made it unclear as to when exactly Yim went missing. His sister left the home that morning and never saw him again, and there were no witnesses to indicate at what time Yim left his home. As a whole, Few details are available in the case. It is unknown if Yim had a car, and if he did, if he'd taken it when he left the house that day. It is also unknown if he took any possessions with him. Yim was a student entering his third year at Stony Brook University, a public university on Eastern Long Island. He hadn't yet declared his major, but told his family he was doing well in school. Over the summertime, while he was home with family, he participated in four units of summer classes for school. Family described the 20-year-old as an introverted and quiet man, with few close friends and no known partner. He never had trouble with anyone, and it seemed like himself in the days before his disappearance. His family did not believe he would run away from home. Stony Brook's summer term ended two days after Yim vanished. A few days after this, his family received a letter from the university, which revealed that the 20-year-old had been expelled for not maintaining adequate academic standing. Few theories are available in Yim's case, given the lack of information and exposure, but online sleuths have speculated that perhaps the student took his own life after struggling academically. He may have been struggling because of his poor mental health, or his mental health may have been negatively affected by his inability to perform well in school. As the university is around 40 miles from Yim's home, it has been theorized that he took a train in that general direction and got off somewhere along the way, and his body was simply never found. One armchair detective pointed to a case where a body was found in a heavily wooded area on Long Island in 2004, and was estimated to have been there since the 1980s. Hopes were briefly raised for the family in 2011, when several bodies were found in the Gilgo and Oak Beaches area of Long Island. Now associated with the Long Island serial killer, authorities thought one of the bodies at the time, which belonged to an unidentified individual named John Doe 8, was possibly Yim. However, DNA confirmed that the body was not that of the students. John Doe number 8 is still unidentified. Yim's parents still live in the same house, hoping to see him again. Yim Yong Choi was last seen at 8.30 in the morning on August 26, 1998. He is an Asian male of Chinese descent with black hair, brown eyes, and a height of 5 foot 10. When he was last seen, he weighed 140 pounds and wore glasses. He went by the nickname Jimmy, and if still alive, would be 43 years old. If you have any information about Yim's whereabouts, you can contact the New York State Missing Persons Clearinghouse on 1-800-346-3543 or the Nassau County Police Department on 516-573-8800. Ruby Ackers our penultimate case this month comes from the historic town of Sherman in Texas, a location chosen by our patron, Heather Allen. With a population of less than 45,000, Sherman is home to one of the state's most beautiful wildlife parks, the Hageman National Wildlife Refuge, and several fascinating museums. It's also where the strange case of Ruby Ackers took place. Ruby was a 75-year-old woman residing in the Sherman Nursing Center in January of 1986. This was not, however, Ruby's permanent home. Her loved ones described her as an independent woman who, although had started suffering from brief moments of confusion, was not seriously impaired. Ruby was living in the nursing home temporarily while she recovered from a dislocated shoulder 
an injury she had sustained in her home. She had been living in the facility for around two months before her vanishing. On a cold but sunny January day, Ruby approached the nurse's station in the center and requested that her stitches be removed. At some point before her disappearance, the 75-year-old had cut her finger so badly that it required stitches. The nurse explained that she was in the middle of caring for another patient, but that she would assist Ruby when she was finished. 10 minutes later, at around 3 p.m., the nurse went to Ruby's room to help her. However, the 75-year-old wasn't there. Her dentures and eyeglasses were lying on her bedside table, while the jumper she always wore, regardless of whether she was indoors or out, had been neatly folded and left on the bed. In the weeks following Ruby's disappearance, her friends and family searched desperately for her. They were accompanied by concerned locals, as well as law enforcement. Authorities at the city, state, and county levels were involved in the manhunt, and every Sherman police officer was sent to assist in the search, including those on reserve. The search started in and around Baker Park, but spread out from there over the following days. A helicopter was used to help in an examination of a nearby creek bed, while searchers on foot combed through its steep embankments. Despite all their attempts, no trace of Ruby was ever found. While a few tips trickled into the Sherman Police Department, none of them panned out. Less than a month after her disappearance, the case turned cold. Ruby's grandson, Daniel, continues to look for answers. The 75-year-old enjoyed going out on walks and was well known in the neighborhood, partly because she'd spent so much of her life running a local laundromat. The family believed that if someone had seen Ruby, they would have recognized her immediately. According to Daniel, the family had had lunch with his grandmother on the day of her disappearance. Afterwards, they left to attend a funeral. When they returned home, they were told she was missing. Additionally, Daniel told the Herald Democrat that care home staff were instructed not to speak with the family. In the weeks following Ruby's vanishing, her family received several bizarre anonymous calls, which told them that the 75-year-old had died in the care home from an accidental overdose of the antipsychotic drug, Thorazine. The caller explained that the home had disposed of her body, although they did not say exactly what happened to it or where it was buried. The information the caller gave has never been confirmed, and the caller themselves has never been identified. While her case has largely been forgotten about in the media, a 2010 article by the Herald Democrat put it into the spotlight once more. The report featured the words of a retired public safety sergeant who said, you can't give up. We just want to find out what happened to her. Despite this renewed appeal for information, the case remains unsolved. Ruby Akers was 75 years old at the time of her disappearance in January of 1986. Oddly, the exact date of her disappearance is unknown. Her Charlie Project page and other articles about the case state it was sometime in January. Additionally, her date of birth is not listed and her height and weight are unknown. Ruby is a white woman who wore dentures and glasses although both were found left behind in her room. She was last seen wearing a green and red shirt and green trousers. If you have any information about the whereabouts of Ruby Ackers, you can call the Sherman Police Department on 903-892-7290. Richard Sikorsky. Our final case location this month comes from our patron Law, who chose the city of Morristown in New Jersey. Known as the capital of American Revolution, Morristown is home to around 20,000 people and is perhaps most notable for the preservation of several sites that were important during the American Revolutionary War, including Jockey Hollow and the Ford Mansion, the latter of which was the home of George Washington, among others, during the war. Although lesser known for its violent crime, Morristown is home to some of New Jersey's most enduring cold cases. Richard Sikorsky was 27 years old when he was found dead in his basement apartment at 23 Western Avenue on Monday, August 11th, 1980. 
His landlord had entered the home to check on some reported plumbing problems, but was instead met with the sight of his shirtless young tenant. There was some blood on the walls at around waist height, which led investigators to believe the young man had stumbled around his home before collapsing. Richard had grown up in the township of Clark, New Jersey. By all accounts, he had an ordinary childhood and dropped out of Arthur Johnson Regional High School in his senior year, opting to join the Navy instead. After being honorably discharged, Richard moved to Morristown in the autumn months of 1979. He initially lived in a rented room at the YMCA in Washington Street, but a fire partially destroyed the living quarters. He then spent a brief time at 245 South Street before moving to his Western Avenue apartment on August 1st, 1980. His father noted that Richard did not drive and his new apartment was much closer to his place of work. Richard had no criminal record and was enrolled in a clerical training program with the Morris County Employment Training Administration. However, he had not been to work in the week before his death. According to his father, George, Richard was feeling down in the weeks before his death and appeared to be afraid of staying in his apartment. He reportedly wanted to return home to his parents on the weekend of the 16th, which was five days after he was found dead. But his father had told him to wait until the following weekend. George told the Daily Record, he wasn't himself since he moved in on August 1st. Something was upsetting him. We knew he was afraid to stay there. When Richard moved into the apartment on Western Avenue, there were no window screens. Shortly before he died, the 27-year-old installed half screens. Each night before he went to bed, Richard would remove the screens and lock his windows. While George didn't know why his son wasn't at work, he said that Richard spent a lot of time talking about the security on the doors at his apartment. Richard had died from a subdural hematoma, which is a condition where blood collects between the skull and the surface of the brain. However, this was not the only injury he had sustained. He had bruises to the head, two black eyes, a cut lip, a bloody nose, and bruising to his ankles, knees, shoulders, and buttocks. Authorities noted that the bruises on his body were symmetrical, which left them stumped for several days following the discovery of the body. Dr. Ernest Tucker, the Morris County Deputy Medical Examiner, ruled that Richard had been beaten to death, likely around 48 hours before the discovery of the body. Investigators theorized that he'd managed to make his way home before dying, as there was a lack of disturbance in the house. Possibly further supporting this theory is that when Richard's body was found, the rear screens over his windows were in place and his door had been locked from the inside. No signs of forced entry could also indicate that the killer had a key or that the 27-year-old had let the perpetrator inside willingly. Although, again, the only real evidence at the scene was the blood on the walls. It is unclear how much blood there was. The state medical examiner then revealed that there were indications that he was, quote, bound by sexual devices before death, leading to the theory that Richard's demise was a case of BDSM gone wrong or that he had been sexually abused before death. As a result of this theory, his autopsy photos were sent in to a medical examiner in San Francisco who had experience with sexual crimes. A news report from August 29th stated that this ME confirmed that Richard had indeed been sexually abused prior to his death. However, this did not open up the case for authorities. Not only was Richard still relatively new in town, but he was known to be withdrawn and had very few friends, which made it difficult for authorities to determine what had taken place in the days before his death. In the week following the murder, about a dozen acquaintances and relatives were interviewed, but no suspects or solid leads came forward. After being allowed access to his psychiatric records, Law enforcement determined that the 27-year-old had begun experimenting with sex with other men. They also discovered that he frequented a restaurant that was known to be a meeting spot for members of the LGBTQ community, although the eatery did not cater specifically to this community. The restaurant owner told reporters that Richard was always alone 
and always left alone. He never spoke of any friends, and as far as I could tell, he wouldn't hurt a fly. Once more, this information failed to propel the case forward. Two months after Richard's murder, in October of 1980, the police announced that they'd reached a dead end in the case. With no witnesses, no evidence, and the fact that investigators were unable to locate any close friends, authorities had virtually nothing to go on. It has never been established what Richard had done on the day of his murder, or on the days leading up to it. George Sikorsky believed that his son knew his killer. He told reporters that he planned on hiring a psychic and offered a $1,000 reward for any information which would lead to a suspect and conviction in the case. But this money was never claimed. Richard Sikorsky's case is still unsolved. If you have any information about his murder, you can contact the Morris County Prosecutor's Office on 973-285-6200. And there you have the facts. Thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon, and a special congratulations to the winners of this month's prize draw. Good luck to all of those entering into next week's draw, and if you'd like to enter, please check out our Patreon by following the link below. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.